Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Alex. Welcome to Solidarity Live. How are you? Morning. Um, you know, fine. Uh, adjusted for pandemic terms. Well, um, things are, are are going okay, I think, uh, in the world of progressive, just building our power, getting to where I can see uh, us getting some big wins. It mm -hmm. stings when we have uh, some losses. So we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, Amazon unionization, the first Amazon unionization drive. Um, I think we, we uh, see that one going down um, and in a, in a big way. So that stings, but still I'm, uh, I'm generally optimistic even on Amazon even on Amazon um, unionization. It's just the first one. I don't think this is a force that's going to stop. I 100% agree with this. I think we talked about this last show. It's really interesting how <laughs> maybe it's a flaw of political reporting. Maybe it's just a flaw of the human psyche. We tend to view these wins and losses in such linear terms. But the reality is that the hype around the Amazon unionization effort was profound, both in like a national sense, but within the worker organizing sphere. It's a, and I think it's really important to remember that Alabama is not like a big pro-union area. The fact that this happened at all in Alabama is, I think, a really good thing. Yeah, and I, I also just structurally, it's actually really hard to unionize. I mean, they're they're fighting against uh, forty years minimum of like massive, massive increase in uh, union busting. So mm -hmm. the corporations can actually spend like almost unlimited, unrestricted money uh, bringing these uh, consultants in. And you know, deducting it as an expense, uh, but bringing these consultants in who have, you know, this is a tens of billions or hundreds. I can't remember the. I think it's tens of billions uh, industry union busting. So I mean, they have incredible uh, materials. They have tested all of this stuff. They uh, they understand. You know, they they hire the best psychologists to bring in and say. How do we create uh, a environment where unionization is likely to fail? Uh, and so like being able to overcome that is very difficult and getting it in one is extremely difficult. So I think of it as uh, we talked about what is losing last time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, losing is when you when you give up um, the the loss of a one battle is a setback. So I'm excited to see where the Amazon organizing goes. Um, and I, I'm hoping that we see actually a flourishing of uh, other unionization efforts. And I also hope that we see some legislative efforts at curtailing the union busting industry. You know, the PRO Act uh, has a lot of parts uh, to it that would at least even the playing field slightly so that uh, people's right to collectively bargain and form a union are protected. We know that the bosses will not do it out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, and so it has to be actually protected by government action. And so I think, you know, this loss is something that needs to be taken into the calculus and then we need to redouble or re-triple our efforts at, at, at building the understanding that when workers are unionized, when labor wins, people win. Uh, and the only losers are billionaires uh, with who can't afford their next yacht. Uh, right now, you saw a bunch of workers who felt that if their shop in Bessemer, Bessemer um, unionized, that they they weren't sure that that was, you know, uh, for their benefit. So it's a big hurdle that we have to to overcome. But again, I'm I'm still pretty optimistic. So I, I want to hear where you are on on Amazon, which I think is just coming in now, uh, and and the other issues. But I'm still optimistic about what I'm seeing. Well, and I think one of the important things is that we still have work to do in 
the media space and the organizing space and really helping people ar articulate what a union does. I was really interested in the people, the workers in Alabama who were giving their reasons for or against. And uh, one of the critiques by workers, not consultants, not DC people, was, well, we make, we make good money. You know, there are ways to move forward. There are professional opportunities. Why would I risk that with a union? And it's like, I, I understand that must feel very, not only counterproductive, but sort of stressful. Like, why are you guys creating drama when I have this good job? Okay, the problem though is one, the people who are enjoying their work at Amazon, it's not, it's not the majority. But two, I think what people need to understand about unionizing, organizing efforts, anything when it comes to workplace safety, it's not really about whether or not you like your individual job. It's about whether or not you are legally protected from being exploited. It's about ensuring that if you get, you know, a crazy boss or a crazy situation that you're still going to be able to have the rights as a worker that allow you to continue to earn money for your family and adjust safe. And by the way, safe means mentally safe. So not having to pee into a water bottle because you only get a five minute bathroom break. That is what a union is about. It's not necessarily about making more money. That's ideally part of it. But it's also, it's also a basic human rights protection to assume that you are safe at work. And that's that's what I think is missing from this whole conversation. Although, yeah. oh, what were you going to say? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree with you, um, but you can do with your although as well. Uh, I just, I think that one of the factors as somebody who's like super pro union, right? I want workers to collectively bargain and form a union. Um, and I, I think in the... A few other spaces, uh, we we don't give enough room for this discussion that uh, of the negative parts of stuff, right? And and mainly it's because the bosses are sociopathic, I mean, amoral villains. So when they're like, you know, if you unionize, we're going to shut down this whole facility. They mean it. They do that. If you unionize, you're gonna lose your job and we'll replace you. They mean it. Mm -hmm. They e act illegally all the time. This is literally the company that the richest man in the world uh, owns, right? I mean, the richest man in the world who's like, I'm gonna destroy Earth and go to Mars uh, because all you people uh, can can die. I don't care, peasants. So like. You know, I get why somebody who is is working at a decent wage uh, in uh, a warehouse and, you know, it's hard work, but they probably know that out there, there are people without any jobs, this raging pandemic, there's all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's the same thing that happens when we fight for Medicare for all. I, I think we discount the fear that people have of losing what they have. Uh, because they know that people are associated. They know that that the insurers and the pharmaceutical companies uh, let people die to make money. And they're like, well, if that's the case, I don't really want to be finding myself in a situation where I'm in their crosshairs. So that's why we need workers to to you know come together and form solidarity and keep marching uh, with the people. And we need all of this stuff. Um, pragmatic solidarity is totally key, but politicians in DC can't expect, you know, the workers to to take all of the risk, uh, and so that's why we need to increase these protections uh, and make it easier for union for workers to understand that you know the sociopathic bosses who literally will watch the world burn and plan on going to Mars, right? Like, I really think that that's in people's brains uh, and that they're being told by these consultants who come in, right? You're a warehouse worker and these consultants come in with $3,000 suits. Uh, they one-on-one -on -one you. They so they have a one-on-one -on -one training. They have a video that they've made, all of this stuff. 
uh, and they create rat squads, right? So they're like, you come on the side of the bosses, tell us who are uh, the union organizers, we'll fire them and we'll promote you, all of that stuff. That's what happens right now. Uh, so is it a rational decision for people to be scared of these sociopaths and 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 make moves to protect their own personal uh, living and their and their family? You know, I think we have to understand that motivation. This is not a drama uh, for for people in the middle of it, right? It's not a story. It's their lives, uh, and so we need to crush the villains a little bit at the top. Um, you know, just make the Elon Musk's of the world and. Uh, who literally tweeted out, we can coup whatever country we want. Like, think of the level of villainry that you have to have to say that. Uh, we have to push our politicians to enact policies that protect workers and make them feel like those threats uh, actually can be punished. That, you know, we, we watch publicly people do illegal things, right? Uh, bosses and, and, and uh, corporations do illegal things. And people are like, hey, that's an NLRB uh, violation. And they're like, oh, well, actually, for the entire Trump administration, the NLRB was dismantled and didn't have a quorum for some parts of it, right? Like, oh, that's right. The functioning of the government is important uh, to enforce this stuff. And people are looking around and being like, I'm not sure I believe that that's the government is on my side. I just watched the government definitely not be on my side for a while. Well, um, and this is and this is the problem that we have, and it's something I've been really reading and reflecting on a lot lately. In a broader way, we have a problem right now where working and middle class people are held to insane standards of heroism when it comes to social change. They really are, and you know. They have to be educated and informed on every issue. They have to know like how to change their government. You know, you see these like weird quotes about we get the government we deserve. And obviously I am all about being involved in your political structures or we wouldn't be doing this show. However, what I think we really need to do for us to sort of heal as people who are not billionaires is to realize that we did not create these problems. We did not create a world where a person like Jeff Bezos can exploit a million people just through the people he employs. That doesn't count the people way he's, he explicitly sort of exploits all of us by abusing our tax system. But these people are the villains. It's not, and as much as we all need to get involved and be educated and mobilize, and we absolutely need to do that, I also think we need to give ourselves and each other a lot of grace because it is actually tremendously difficult to be an American citizen right now. We have a pandemic where there were no reasonable public health interventions taken. We have a world where every single basic part of American adult life from housing to food to education has become exorbitantly dangerous and or expensive. And we need to realize that like, yeah, sometimes we lose because the odds are stacked astronomically against us. And the fact that we win at all is actually a cause for tremendous hope and excitement and gratitude for each other. I mean, it is actually like you, you read the stories of the workers that started this. You think about the courage that takes to take on the richest man in the world that is a level of courage that I find tremendously inspiring. I so, agree. Yeah. I yeah. agree. And that's why we have to uh, be looking to push. And I, I agree the sacrifice that we demand of people to do the right thing, right? Like if you're on the villain side, you're just, you get to do whatever, right? Like there's no rules. They're like, well, of course they're lying and don't have statistics no. and they're the villains. But but you who are fighting on the right side, if you even make an honest mistake, we're going to just rake you over the coals forever. Um, and, and I think this is really important. Sorry, I interrupted you, but you're. I'll let you. Well, you're we're on like eleven thousand to zero on the interrupting uh, <laughs> score. So uh, mark one for you. Good work. Wait, um, <laughs> I actually 
So I'm not anti-cancel culture or anything because I think everybody agrees that people who like rape or use racist slurs or whatever should not be allowed to say whatever they want, right? Okay, fine. The problem though is I do think there is something happening in social media right now where instead of putting all of our energy, whatever energy we can spare into fighting the bad guys, we are like, that, I just like think you're framing that incorrectly. And that is not the way to frame it. It's like, unless somebody is actively saying something that is ill-intentioned or is of course, of course, like racist, sexist, homophobic, whatever. But social media has made it tremendously easy and addictive for people to be unkind to one another. And I just find that so unfortunate because it is so not how we organize on the internet. I assume you're going to agree with this because we've talked yeah. about it before. I just, uh, I also think like Twitter, you know, if you really want to increase your mental health, you just turn off Twitter. It's just like amazing. You just bloop. Uh, <laughs> and, and if you don't have the, the strength to do that, like me, I don't have the strength to do that. I'm on Twitter. It's mute, 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 mm -hmm. mute. Um, because, and, and I will say that all it's done is amplify something that's actually been around forever, which is that, you know, like the talkers love talking, man, and they have done nothing, nothing, but man, will they criticize, uh, anything because if only you had listened to them and all their talking, but generally I, uh, have ignored them for years before Twitter currently. Um, if you haven't put up numbers in a real way. If you haven't organized something uh, and and won some stuff, uh, then I'm I don't really care what you say. Uh, if it's in if it's in a discussion, right? In good faith, I'm all for it. I talk to all sorts of people, but I mean, if you're gonna come at uh, the organizing, I'm just gonna ignore it. And 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 it's not new. So I, I want to get to some stuff that's going on on the hill right now. But I I, I had this discussion with. Um, uh, with Lauren Steiner the other day on her show. Uh, one of the best lessons that Marion Barry, who's the former mayor of DC, mayor for life, Marion Barry, uh, taught me uh, when I was organizing uh, on HIV policy in Washington, DC, uh, me and my now business partner at We Act Radio, Kimon Freeman, we were organizing for things like free condom distribution, which we won, um, needle exchange funding, which we won, uh, and other public health prioritization of the out of control HIV epidemic. Um, we were organizing in, in Southeast Washington, DC, which is uh, historically the black part of DC. I think it's about 90% African American uh, and is the forgotten part of DC in terms of policy wise, right? Like people think of DC as the sliver of it, the Northwest, which just so happens uh, to be the white part of DC. Uh, and historical structural racism is really geographic in DC. It's, a, you know, slaves built the capital. It's been segregated um, for uh, forever. And Marion Barry, I think rightly was, was skeptical of the work that Kamon and I were doing, uh, a white organizer and a black organizer working on this stuff. Um, and so he was not totally bought in as in, in the beginning. Uh, but as he saw us put up numbers, and actually start building power by, by convincing people week after week after week um, that we needed to change our, our healthcare system in DC. He came on board. And at that time, um, which I don't even know how many years ago, I'm old now, but it's, I was younger and I was like, I was like, oh, this guy, you know, he was a big, he didn't get on board right away. So I'm not going to trust him. And, and I, and I was just still a, a little bit like, you know, I'm the pure one and he's just coming on board for uh, political expediency. And he, he had a really great conversation with me, which uh, I'm, I, I still look back on it. It was very short in the moment. Uh, and he was sort of like hand on my shoulder, like, just don't worry. We're like uh, ignoring me actually <laughs> a lot. <laughs> like, like what I was saying, you know, I was like, uh, and he's like, look, here are some problems with organizing, uh, left organizing, and I'm not gonna quote them, it's like general sentiment. Um, when someone's walking towards you, don't punch them in the face. That was one of his things. Don't punch people in the face when they're walking towards you. And what he meant is when you convince people to get on your side, uh, don't punch them because they're walking towards you, right? Like you, you wanna invite them in. 
You want to build power. You don't actually bristle at people who were wrong at one point uh, becoming right. Uh, and, and that actually is a big deal. Like, even if they're terribly wrong, if we can believe in their humanity, which I do, uh, we can actually, uh, you know, working with restorative justice and things, we can bring people to our side uh, and, and, and recognizing that the system is the problem. The system is the problem, not the, the victims of the system. Uh, or uh, I think Michael Brooks used to say it a lot, a lot of sympathy for the conned, none for the con man. Right, like so, that's a, a important things. But the other one that is more to this, you know, I don't believe that cancel culture is a thing. I think that it's just like words that are put on something that has always existed, and it's mainly for older uh, white people to freak out about on Fox News because um, they're like, they're trying to cancel your salmon-colored shirts, and old men are like, no, my golf shirt, and you're like, I am trying to cancel that. And Christmas, just because. Um, but what Marion Barry said is, uh, remember, don't punch the person in the face who's standing right next to you just because it's easiest to reach them. And it's actually a really profound thing. And again, he said it really quickly. And I was like, I don't even know what you're saying, man. Uh, but over time, I really learned to, to, that those two things are really important in organizing. It's easiest to attack the people who are closest to us politically, also personally, right? Like this is a psychological thing. And in fact, our opponents are usually pretty far away from us. It's actually difficult to figure out how to use our collective power to impact them in any way since like billionaires have insulated themselves as much as possible from people. Uh, so it is harder to actually organize against our targets, our opposition, and it's much easier to just criticize the people who are closest to us ideologically. Uh, and that's what I see this, you know, the internecine uh, S shows on Twitter uh, ish shows on Twitter that uh, happen oh, all the time. <laughs> and uh, it's just people who are, are lazy and weak. Um, some of them are just misguided or, or they haven't learned enough yet. But mainly I see it driven by weak losers um, who actually don't want to do the hard work of building power to actually fight our opposition. Well, and I think it's really difficult to weed through this sometimes. And I agree with you, Alex, we should get to Biden's job plan and infrastructure because I think it's a really exciting conversation. But I do want to at least talk about this a little, maybe even say this on every single show, like we need to love and be there for each other because the fight we're in is very, very difficult. And this temptation to like, criticize the people you know. I love that you say that, Alex, because it's so true. It's not about cancel culture. This is just a thing humans have always done. This is a truth of human nature. We tend to, when we have some kind of unresolved emotional anxiety or sense of inferiority or whatever, we're not gonna go to Jeff Bezos, the most powerful man in the world, and be like, hey man, I've been having some issues with the way you're running things. No, of course not. We're gonna pick on the activist that we think isn't doing correctly. You know, and it's one of the truths, and I've really found this to be true, and I promise there's psychological research that backs me up on this. Whenever you deal with people who are negative or cynical or angry, these are typically people who don't feel particularly empowered in their own lives. And there can be a lot of different reasons for that. Like maybe they have a traumatic history. Maybe they're just like not particularly good people. And so they're not good at owning their power and owning their efficacy, whatever it is. I have never met someone who is cynical slash angry, who isn't behind that a deeply insecure person. So am I saying that like we, you know, invite those people over to our homes? No, but I think the way to weed through the sort of pettiness that can exist is to ignore it and stick with the people who are positive and uplifting and have a plan. Mute, 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 mute. Yeah. Mute. Well, but, and the final thing I will say, the way to avoid all this 
you know, and this is true in romantic relationships too, right? Like, you know, the person you're most likely to get annoyed at or irritable with is the person that you see for 16 hours a day, especially now in quarantine. But like the way to avoid getting irritable with each other and unkind to each other is to stay focused on the goal, you know? Mm -hmm. And exactly. so for a romantic relationship, that's your shared life together. Politically, that's our shared political goals. We have policy objectives. We have cultural objectives. We have objectives for the kind of world we want to hand our children. And what's exciting is when we focus on that, we don't have time to snipe at each other and gossip about each other and be unkind to one another on the internet over nothing, which is probably a good segue into our policy objectives. Yeah, I, I think it is. <laughs> uh, I, I I do. I, I want to, though, not move there right away because it's just something you said is so true. It's the punching people who are closest to you. Yeah. And interpersonal, that is all the time too, right? So understanding the self-care necessity of uh, doing this work is also really important because it takes a tremendous toll. Um, and when you face a crushing loss, uh, of like, you know, a crushing loss of you tried to do something and you lost, and the powers that you lost to are ones that are way outside of your ability to communicate with, well, you carry that. That, that hurt, that harm, that loss, that whatever, there's, a, there's an impact on you. Uh, and you are likely to drop that on the people who you love. Um, and it's a likely to actually like come out as the like, why didn't you push the button to start the dishwasher or whatever? Like, are you really that mad? Uh, or is it, you know, are you fighting about something else? Those kind of uh, fights also flare up in the activist space often. Um, because, you know, you're fighting to, you know, uh, eliminate subsidies to uh, the extractive industries, like, you're going to lose a lot. Um, but the remember, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the thing, though. Remember what Paul Farmer said, the key is you only have to win once. Um, and, and, and so once you win, uh, you win. Uh, so you have to, we have to create a really pragmatic solidarity, our culture of pragmatic solidarity, um, where we are also excising toxic actors, because I do think that um, the left sometimes has this, even though like there's the, the whatever, the like tendency to, I hate saying cancel culture, because I literally think that's that's like a Tucker Carlson thing um, to, to believe that people are coming for their madras shorts. And I'm like, if only, <laughs> if only. Um, <laughs> if cancel culture were real, there would be so many changes in what we see. But yes. in fact, it's not real. But on the left, there is a, you know, whatever that is, like a, a tendency for criticism or whatever. But what there's also a, like the ability for bad actors to prey on like leftist sensibilities to remain in the movement and to actually hijack the movement. And you know who saw this uh, as a real benefit was uh, was uh, the FBI mm -hmm. <laughs> with uh, with COINTELPRO to to disarm the the activists in the in the civil rights movement. Right, they turn them all on each other. And I I will just sort of finish this part with saying that's what Marion Barry was talking about. Um, and Marion Barry, I think, for a lot of people who don't know, um, who didn't grow up in DC uh, and, and mainly like uh, all white people, they think of him as the mayor who smoked crack, right? They're like, oh yeah, he's, the, he's that funny mayor who smoked crack. Um, if you're in DC, if you wanna see uh, a person who uh, it, like every time we would do organizing in, in Ward 8, uh, he would come in to this, the Highlands Public Library, uh, Ward 8 Democrats meeting, and he'd walk in. He was always late because then they'd stop the program. He was a master politician. They'd stop the program, whatever was going on, and the speaker would have to be like, oh, I see the council member from Ward 8 coming. Everybody give a big hand for Mary and Barry, mayor for life. And everyone would. And he'd take off his hat, and he'd sort of wave it, and he'd go up. And usually it was to like a really... Uh, like a nice older woman, you know, grandma, and he'd go over and he'd be like, Betty, how are you? How is 
uh, Alvin, and which is the grandson, and she'd always be like, he's still got that job that you got him, Marion. Um, and the love and the realness of that is so powerful because that's what he did. He created the Marion Barry Summer Youth Employment Program, which is like one of the best policies that I, I can think of. Uh, he watched how there was overt uh, pressure and assassination, uh, character assassination in the system work to destroy people. And I'll sort of end with why did the DEA set up the mayor of DC in a televised sting uh, to bust him for using drugs, right? Not for corruption, not for anything other than using drugs. And I would posit that COINTELPRO has evolved, uh, but not been eliminated. And that the man that watched walked at the right hand of MLK, who is Marion Barry, who walked at the right hand of MLK, uh, was a, a victim of a system that actually it was set up to destroy people. So it's all like, I think, important to recognize the playing field that we're on uh, and the difficulty that we face. Uh, and that was, you know, I, all of that is sort of kicked off by this. I'm sure the news is going to be like crushing loss, uh, Amazon, big winner at the U and I think, yeah, it was it was one election. A lot of lessons were learned, uh, but workers on the move, people on the move, and progressive power building, they haven't been able to turn us aside yet. Um, and I still feel we're making great advances. And, you know, so I had this, <laughs> we keep saying we're gonna move to infrastructure. I know. <laughs> we, really are. we really are, okay? I keep but looking I at the time to be like, <laughs> is it time? <laughs> we, have, we have 25 whole minutes, yeah. all right? Infrastructure. Is everything. Everything is infrastructure. Everything is infrastructure. Just become a Zen. Solidarity <laughs> is infrastructure. This discussion <laughs> is infrastructure. Okay, I'm gonna say one more thing, okay? Um, so when I was young and terrible, <laughs> like I have said this on this show before, and I'll say it many places. I was like the worst. I was the worst. I was the most like cynical existentialist atheist who like you know was channeling all her rage at the powers that be into like i know everything and everything is great and like you know i think this energy is very common on the left because when you start you know i was a teenager my brain wasn't even finished cooking like you know you're getting all this really negative stimulus about how bad everything is and it's understandable to go there but a significant change happened gradually as I got older and slightly more mature and realized that it's not just about winning, it is also about winning, but it's about the people we are when we get there. And if we're fighting for this world that we wanna see, but we're becoming this like emotionally decrepit people who hate everyone and everything, what are we fighting for? You know, part of the solidarity that we hold with one another and the love that we have for each other and ourselves, by the way, is to make sure that we are participating in the world that we want to create. Because I don't look, I'm not trying to say like, oh, a cynic is as bad as Jeff Bezos. Of course, that's not true. But there is something to the fact that like, do we really want to embody the energy of the people that we're trying to to fight against? You know, I mean, it's not. That's not what any of us want, which is why in Biden's infrastructure plan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what what we're talking about is, is this, uh, when we say infrastructure plan, we should just spell out, like, we just had this big relief plan, um, yeah. 1.9 trillion. Now there's going to be another one, and uh, but it looks like we, we actually, there's going to be two this year and then maybe three next year. These are all uh, reconciliation bills, which just means they need 50 votes, right? It's just to get around the, um, the, the slave owner protection clause uh, the in the, <laughs> the, the filibuster in the slave owner protection body, the Senate, right? I mean, the most anti-majoritarian force, uh, maybe not the most, Electoral College might actually 
be uh, more anti-majoritarian, but man, probably not. I still think Senate holds up that. So they, you know, Schumer had a big win uh, and, and I got to hand it to him. I want to eliminate the filibuster, but it's a hard slog to get there. And I want cash in people's pockets. I want people to to feel that solidarity uh, and see that their government is capable and willing uh, to protect them and work with them. So I'm happy that he went and he must have been ho holding this thing in his pocket for a long time, Jocelyn. I feel like he knew because he, he had his experts lined up and they went in and they, they got the parliamentarian to look at the rules and be like, uh, yeah, this is true. And we can have a whole discussion on the rules, but basically the you can do anything you want in the Senate as long as like you have a real will uh, and good staff. Because you just have to find like one thing, right? And they're like, oh, look, in the proceedings in 1820, uh, mm -hmm. it, it actually occurred that this happened. So there's precedent. And then everyone's like, I say, that's true. All right, that's a Senate rule carved in stone. They can change them anytime. So at the end, what it means is that there's going to be two bills. And, and that actually cuts two ways because I, I'm always very skeptical of the oh, we're totally on your side and we want to do all the things that you're saying, but they're not going to be in this bill. They're going to be in the next bill. And we were literally told that in the first reconciliation to this reconciliation, right? Like, oh, we want to have more coverage. We want to expand public health programs uh, in the midst of a pandemic, but let's do that in the next bill. And now we're kind of hearing similar stuff where they're like, oh, we, we want to do that in this one, but let's do it in the next one. This one is for infrastructure. This is the jobs one. And the next one's the family one. And I'm sort of like, I want to get as much. If we get two bills, I don't want it to be split in half and half done in one and half done. In the, I want the whole kit and caboodle done in one. And then I want more done in the next one. And well, don't worry. There's enough to do in this country. And there's there's also, so I want to give people a little bit of context. I'm sure that on a, superficially, although probably not to our audience because we're progressives here, but superficially it can seem almost plausible. Is healthcare uh, infrastructure, is you know care for our elders and our children infrastructure? Forgetting that, like this idea of infrastructure is relatively like a modern idea. And the actual definition is the basic structures which allow a society to function. And we are in the middle of a pandemic where in many communities, the patient zero was nursing home facilities, where it, there was just a massacre among our older citizens. And it's not like that was isolated to them. It then, you know, creates more COVID clusters in those communities. Like investing in these care structures is not like some fruity, emotional, sentimental act. It is an essential public health intervention, which absolutely qualifies as the structures we need for our society to function. The reason a road is a part of that because it's terribly difficult to have a domestic economy when you it's you know hard to drive places. But that's it's also difficult to have a domestic economy when everyone is dying. I feel or, unfortunate that I have to say that. Yeah. And I, the good news is I, I, I've i seen all the numbers, you know, Data for Progress has a bunch of polling on this. And uh, the American people aren't fooled, right? It's just Republican politicians who are like, so you're trying to tell me that broadband is infrastructure? <laughs> yeah, really? Next, you'll be telling me that electrical grids are infrastructure? And everyone's like, yeah, those are yes. infrastructure. Yeah. Those are definitely infrastructure. Um, In fact, um, quick moment, if you want to learn more about the Republican war on power grids, read this book. It is yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, continue, Alex. And also, we have a great novel coming out uh, related to this on Strong Arm yes. Press pretty soon. We yes, can, we do. We can shout that out in a, in, uh, in a bit. Lie. But Testimony. Yeah. <laughs> it, be, be warned, we will be talking about it uh, uh, at length. The yes. point is, what's going on right now you actually do have two plans, the American Family Plan and the American uh, Jobs Plan. And we were working to put it into one package and get it to be as big as possible. And now they've sort of said, we're gonna do the Family Plan and the Jobs Plan separately. Um, and again, it's okay, but our progressive priorities, like I, I, don't, I don't care what your title is. Um, 
part of it has to do with the committees that it goes through, but like, I literally don't care and I don't want any excuses uh, from any politician. I want more coverage. Mm -hmm. I want drug prices to go down. Uh, I want roads to be built. I want broadband access for every single person in this country. I want hundreds of billions of dollars to go into uh, uh, home and community-based care, as you were saying. Um, those are all real infrastructure. Um, I, I sort of tossed the mic back to you because uh, we can go back and forth on where things stand, but I really love this thing that Mary uh, said last time, Mary Small from Indivisible, who we spoke with last uh, week, where she was like, no excuses is the key, right? Like expecting everybody to understand the arcana of uh, Senate processes is, is sort of uh, bad organizing. It's way more important to just demand the things that we want uh, and say we won't take any excuse about uh, getting those. But I want to toss it back to you with, uh, it, you could Google this and find all of these um, uh, these op-eds. It's like George Will, I'm sure, has written like seven of them because that dude's like the stupidest person alive who's paid for being stupid. Like literally the man is just rocks in his head. It's just corrupt. Uh, if you have never read his, his, his op-ed, he literally gets paid like $250,000 a year. And one of his pieces was on the dangers of genes. Uh, dungarees, jeans. He's like, the American I know, the America I know would wear slacks, not jeans, sir. And you're like, get out of here, you. How are you paid for your opinion? You're making this up. That's a real no, go Google it. I'm telling you, I, whenever anyone like drops a link of George Will and is like, actually, he's making some good points. I'm like, he's not. He can't. <laughs> Any person who wrote this is forever banished from the making good points. Um, so, but he's sort of like the Brooks, the Will, the like, oh, I'm a very important person. They love, they're like, look at China. When you go into China and you see their airports and it's all gleaming and new and, and all of this, this uh, mm -hmm. stuff. And it's really sad to compare that with, you know, JFK Airport in New York. I'm t if you just Google some of these words, you'll find a whole ecosystem of people saying that. Um, and especially during the age of austerity, they just kept saying it. And I'm like, do you think that those airports built themselves? Like, do you understand that China and other countries put massive amounts of resources into public works? It's the best thing that you can spend resources on mm -hmm. is investing in our future. Big, giant projects that will continue to bring value to the people for decades and decades and decades. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sewers, water treatments, all of that is the best, the municipal triad, uh, everything that makes our communities work. And these idiot op-ed people who, you know, they're not actually dumb. They're, they're very smart, dumb people. Some of the dumbest people I've met are extremely intelligent. Um, intelligence is not mean. Uh, anything more, right? Like uh, George Will, I'm sure, has a very large IQ that he'll tell you within like three minutes of meeting you. Um, and still he wrote a screed against dungarees. Uh, the point is, they're the same people who don't believe in public investment, right? They're the ones who are like, oh, the bond vigilantes are coming. If you want a country that works, you have to invest in that country. And for 40 years, instead of investing in this country, they're like, oh, maybe give it to the company uh, and see if the market can fix that. And you're like, the market's never fixed anything. It breaks things for profit. Yeah. So that's where I'll throw it over to you is like what we're up against is an elite uh, like BS racket that it that it's somehow really complicated. Like, oh, our roads are crumbling and we don't know what to do. And you're like, we do know what to do. Build well, new roads. So it's so I really love that you say this because okay. So first of all, the words developing countries and third world countries are racist. So I'm not but you know what I'm trying to say. Countries that the West perceives to be developing countries. So America is absolutely in the category of the countries that we phrase in this way. Because I think 
in the racist American ethos, it's like, oh, if you go to Africa or like you go to India or you go to whatever, you know, these are countries where everyone's poor and everyone's homeless. It's like you realize that in these countries you're talking about and you're perceived as being like so poor and so tragic, the thing that is happening there and in those types of countries, it's because of Western imperialism. But the thing that's happening there is that there is a public that has not invested for whatever reason, whether because they can't or because they won't in the public infrastructure, which leads to more of a specific type of poverty, which like, I think Americans tend to think, oh, like, no, we have middle class people here. People are mostly middle class here. No, they're not. No, most people in America are not middle class. And those countries we think of as poor countries have rich and middle class people. It's not like everyone is poor anywhere. The problem is when you have a government, which again, because it has not done its job, because it has not taken our tax dollars and then invested sufficiently in the things those tax dollars are supposed to do, like build roads, build hospitals, prepare for the common defense, this is literally in the constitution, you have more and more people who are becoming homeless. You have more and more people who are losing their homes. This whole, that, that is what a poor country is, you know? And it's like, I, I definitely think we need to continue emphasizing that America is the richest country in the world because we are, but we also need to emphasize that when we say that, we're saying we have more billionaires than anyone. Yeah. We're not saying that we as a working and middle class people are drowning in riches. Most people don't, uh, I've seen the polling on this, most people in America don't believe that we're the richest country in the world in the history of the world. Um, they don't because the wealth is not uh, distributed in, in any sort of uh, equal way. And so people hear that and they just don't buy it. And that's part of the billionaire's game, right? I mean, they really want people to not believe that we have the resources to actually make every single person in this country's life better, uh, to actually invest in infrastructure that is schools and broadband access and health infrastructure and all sorts of other things that would make people not worried about uh, missing a paycheck and going bankrupt or getting in an accident and going bankrupt uh, and not being able to care for their family and their children. Uh, the billionaires want people just tenuously holding on by their fingernails um, so that they will be scared uh, to demand anything more. That's that's the, the sociopathic villainry that I was talking about before. You know, oh, if you try to make your life better, I'll destroy your and your family's life. Like it's 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 uh, organized crime style, right? Um, these are gangsters. That gangster capitalism is is where we actually uh, are sort of in the middle of, and we need to pass things in Washington D.C. that actually uh, change the system that individuals are living in. It's sort of the tying a, a few of the things together. One of the things that happens as you get older and you work in this more and more, uh, some people just get it right away. So it's not like an age thing, but the system versus people becomes more and more apparent as you go that the system is has been corrupted and the system chews people up and spits them out and individuals exist within that structure. But you have to actually adjust the structure. And, and in fact, it's easy to adjust the structure, like things that are like, oh, we can't do anything about that. It's always been that way, right up until it changes, and then we change it. Um, so this fight right now in the Senate uh, to get these big spending bills that are investing in the American people after 40 years of extracting from the people to give to the plutocrats. Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world because his company did not have to pay taxes, unlike mine and everybody else who's not Jeff Bezos. Uh, he didn't have to pay sales tax. It was just a, a loophole that created all of it. We need to change the structure uh, and, and actually reverse the upward redistribution of wealth and get it going the other way so that we're redistributing wealth from the plutocrats 
into the pockets of the people. And the government is rewarded for doing that by the people who keep voting them in office, right? That's the virtuous circle that we have to get to. And all of that is sort of uh, time dependent the, it, right now. A lot of people, the joke is like, oh, this election is the most important election of your life until next election, which will also be the most important election of your life. Um, I feel like there's some truth to that, uh, but what people are missing, I think, is that this governing period right now, these two years, is the most important governing period, I think, of my life uh, mm -hmm. and of our, our, our lives. That if we don't actually get the government working for the people, delivering cash into people's pockets, tangible benefits, um, fighting off the new Jim Crow laws that are that the Republicans at the state level are passing all over this country, uh, then we're we're gonna end up in authoritarianism. We had dumb dumb authoritarianism just like last year, right? Like that was what Donald Trump is. We'll end up in bad, uh, you know, and that was bad. But we'll end up in not dumb dumb authoritarianism. We'll end up in minority rule by the plutocrats forever. Um, and that's why I think this governing period, building things that people recognize in their neighborhoods and showing people the government working for the people, that this is the most important governing period of our lives. Well, and I love that you, yeah, I love that you say that because I do think it's really important that, you know, <laughs> So I really love the history of social movements and what makes them effective and how good hopeful movements ended up not being effective. And I think the thing that really always pops out to me as I'm looking for trends, you have to give people something to focus on that is real and concrete. And congratulations to all of us because there are a lot of very real and concrete things for us to be focusing on right now. And you're absolutely right, Alex, what Trump has shown the conservative party is that they can do pretty much anything and not only get away with it, but almost win again. Like we, uh, I watched an interview with Lindsey Graham last night and he was being asked, well, like, why do you, why do you still maintain a relationship with Donald Trump? What, like, what is it in it for you? He's no longer president. And what he said was chilling. He said, well, I think the thing about Donald Trump is he's the future of the Republican Party. So he may not be president, but I think maintaining a relationship with that person, a friendship with that person is important. Yeah. And that is why we have to organize like things are just as existential as they were before, because they are. We have an advantage now, and that's something to be very excited and hopeful and engaged about. But think about that. Lindsey Graham, longtime very powerful senator, not an idiot, was a never Trumper, now views R Donald Trump as the future of his party. Think about what that says. So, so somebody, um, I'm pretty positive as a, a joke or uh, to be mean to me, um, signed me up for a Quora forum uh, that's pro-Trump. It's like, I can't remember what it's called, like for Trump or Trumpers or something. Um, and it is, it, I get it. Uh, I've come under tons of, uh, of internet attacks for having opinions. Uh, so it could be some a-hole doing that. It could just be one of my friends. Yeah, it could be Brad said, ah, gotcha um, in the chat. So it could be you, Jocelyn. I don't know, but whoever <laughs> probably thought it was going to annoy me. And it's actually just been wonderful to read. Um, really? because these, the, these are folks who just support Donald Trump now. And it will be till the end of time. Um, and they will, they cannot hear any of the stuff that is so apparent to everyone, right? Like for this guy, you're going to sacrifice the Republic for this guy. He's such yeah. a doofus though. But what he's shown is the power of authoritarianism. If you Google right now, Turkmenistan bike ride, you'll see that many autocrats who murder many people and hold power just through force are huge doofuses. They're doofuses. It doesn't matter that they're doofuses. What matters is a change in the structure that's around people that allows these doofuses to maintain power regardless of everything else. And where you see this 
and so dangerous because you can just look at what the Republicans are doing. They're no longer fighting for policies or an ideology. Like you tell me what a Republican, they, they never really believed in small government, right? But like they openly don't believe in small government now. They stand for nothing other than the party of Trump. Uh, and that is authoritarianism. That is a belief that it's like, oh, well, it's too hard to, you know, have this power that is mine. And then I'm going to be culpable for my own uh, consequences. And like, I have to do the hard work. I'm going to just give it to this person and they're going to, they're going to tell me uh, what to do. And I'm going to believe them. Uh, and you say he's a doofus, but he says that he's God emperor. Uh, and he's got a nice fake tan on him. So, right, like people buy into this. This is a thing that people like, and it's super dangerous. Now, the antidote to that is uh, actually creating a government that works because the first step of this is a, a deep, deep cynicism. It's like, oh, well, they're all crooks. They're all crooks. They're all the worst. Um, so I might as well align myself with the worst of the worst because he's the best. I don't exactly know how the brain works, but he's I feel like it's about who he is, Alex. He's authentic. Yes, exactly. Um, so that's why I do think like it's, it's now or, or never uh, in terms of getting uh, this stuff across the finish line and actually building, putting uh, trillions of dollars into projects that actually benefit the American people. And, I'll just sort of end before I toss it to you to close this out that um, don't accept any excuses and we're not going to win on them all. We just, we lose sometimes, but we only lose when we forget what we're fighting for. Just call your members and tell them what you want. Uh, and this is the time when we can get what we want. Some of the things we have to fight for all of them. Uh, like, so is it infrastructure? Yes, of course it is. <laughs> Everything's infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that is the closing note. Please being like daily contact with your members, call them like they owe you money because they do uh, all your elected officials. And by the way, because again, it's not just about this legislation. People will not vote for this unless they really believe that their position in on Capitol Hill is threatened unless they do. And by the way, I want to just close off with this. We are making headway in that regard. There are a lot of Republicans who have said they're willing to work with Biden on a lot of these things, which means we have an inch, like we need to keep going. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We will see you next Friday morning. Bye. Bye.